Um, to kick off the panel discussion, Elisa is just going to give some food for thought and then uh, we'll entertain um, what I'm hoping will be quite a lively discussion. Okay, now um, I'm just going to talk about this piece written by Nicholas of Cusa on the vision of God a little bit before we go to the questions. Um, can everyone see on the wall somewhere or one of the screens if we want to bring it up that probably better on the wall if you can locate one of these pictures of Rembrandt, the self-portrait. There's one over here, over there. There's one on the stage. Because <clears throat> I want you to all which, choose whichever ones. I don't know how this is going to work actually with so many people, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe that last bank of tables can all go and have a look at that. What I want you to do is stand in front of that Rembrandt and look at it and then go to the left and look at it and then go to the right and look at it and I want you to see what you notice about his eyes. This bank here can go to this picture in front. Um, there's one behind, if you guys there want to try it. If those of you that can just get up stand on your feet so, yep. <laughs> hop up unless you little done. exercise <laughs> unless you've done it yourself just recently and rigorously but otherwise you won't believe me unless you try it I know but it's not like having it on the wall when you've got it in the pack so you have to move to, to see the effect of it, so you have to choose at least a few different positions. So see if he's still looking at you when you move position. So try as many different positions as you want. <laughs> yeah, in the National Gallery. Yep. Remain up the front, please, two volunteers. Don't sit down, Gabby. <laughs> no, Lars, okay. Alan, Lars and Alan. All right. Now, Alan, I want you to stay where you are, looking at Rembrandt. All right, now, Lars, is Rembrandt looking at you? Uh, yes. Okay, can you please keep slowly walking to Alan and past Alan okay. and walk all the way to where to the edge of this table here. Yep. Slowly walk, keep looking at it. Is he still looking at you? Yep. Is he still looking at you? Yep. He's still looking at you? Yes. But Alan, is he still looking at you? No. 
Why did I choose you for my volunteer? <laughs> I just want to know if he's looking at you. So, so Alan's staying in one place and he's looking at Alan constantly. He's not looking away from you, is he? He's not moving his eyes to look away. And Lars, you're moving. And he's following you. Right, okay. So, so he's fixed, his gaze is fixed on Alan, but his gaze is moving with Lars. All right, let's remember that for later. You can sit down. <laughs> Alan, you can grab a seat. Oh, really? He was looking down. Oh, that's a good, that's a good example. Because we... Now, can someone... Elevate themselves and look down on him and see if that works. No. <laughs> he can levitate. <laughs> um, so, was there anyone that Rembrandt didn't look at? He didn't look at you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, well, you've got to look at him for it to work. So. Huh. Um, now, the other thing I want to know, how, put up your hand if you have read all of uh, Kuz's paper on the vision of God. You've read all of it. Okay. Put, put up your hand if you've read part of it. Okay, good. Good, good majority of people. And what about, um, has everyone had a chance to look at Helga's article on the sweetness of truth? Who's read that or part of that? Okay, good, excellent. Um, now I want to ask you a question if you go to the next slide please, Doug. What do you think the title of this piece means? Contemplation of God. All right, so Kuza has written about his vision of God, what he, he was striving to see God and he's conveying what he saw. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Basically, not, yeah. Not God's eyesight. Well. well it's God's, God's uh, interpretation of what he wants man trying to be. Okay, God's interpretation of what he wants mankind to be. Okay. How God sees the world. Okay, this is interesting because there's two ways to think about this. There's, there's, and it's important, you know, to think about. I know I thought about it a lot the whole time we've been reading it. Does he mean? <coughs> Is Kuza presenting his vision that he saw of God? This is my vision of God and you know, here I want to convey it to you. Or is he talking about the vision of God, i.e. God's vision? How does God see, as someone said? Uh, and I think, I mean, we're just going to talk about some of the concepts in it before we go to the questions, but I think you'll see that it's both. He's talking about both, absolutely, but... Um, so he's had a profound, a profound insight, I should say, into the nature of God, and you could say he had a vision of God, but this paper is about more than just that vision. It's about Kuz's attempt to get inside that vision. He, got, he had a vision, but he wanted to figure out, you know, what is this vision? What am I looking at here? He wasn't content with seeing God. He wanted to know how God saw. It's a bit reminds you a bit of what Einstein said. I want to know God's thoughts, the rest are details. Now, do you, so this, paper, this piece um, on the vision of God presents a picture of how God himself sees, how he acts. It provides an insight into his creative spirit and how that spirit may manifest itself even, ever more powerfully within us as his instruments. So just very quickly, I want to look at three aspects of this. Kuz's challenge, what he was trying to lead us to see. 
God's vision itself and man's vision, thirdly, or man adopting God's vision, which is more to the point. Um, now, first of all, there's a crucial paragraph on the next PowerPoint there, Doug, which oh, there's three, three paragraphs actually that we all need to just read through together because uh, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion already. Helga referenced it about this idea of breaking with the mode of thinking that we're all used to using. And in this piece, as you'll see, Cousy uses a metaphor of a garden surrounded by a wall which you can't climb that wall on your own. You need God's help to do and God exists within that realm. So we'll just read through this. So Kuzza says, for if I am moved, and he's talking about the icon that we just all experienced, if I am moved, its gaze appears to be moved since it does not desert me. If while I am moving, someone else who is looking at the face remains stationary, then the face's gaze does not desert him either, but remains stationary with him. However, a face that is free from these conditions cannot properly be characterised as stationary and as moved. For such a face exists beyond all rest and motion in most simple and most absolute infinity. Indeed, motion and rest and opposition and whatever can be spoken of or conceived are subsequent to this infinity. Hence, I experience the necessity for me to enter into obscuring mist and to admit the coincidence of opposites beyond all capacity of reason and to seek truth where impossibility appears. And when, beyond that rational capacity and beyond every most lofty intellectual assent as well, I come to that which is unknown to every intellect and which every intellect judges to be very far removed from the truth, there you are present, my God, you who are absolute necessity. And the darker and more impossible that obscuring haze of impossibility is known to be, the more truly the necessity shines forth and the less veiledly it draws near and is present. I thank you, my God, for disclosing to me that there is no other way of approaching you than this way which seems to all men, including the most learned philosophers, altogether inaccessible and impossible. For you have shown me that you cannot be seen elsewhere than where impossibility appears and stands in the way. And you, O oh Lord, who are the nourishment of the full grown, have encouraged me to do violence to myself, because impossibility coincides with necessity and I have found the abode wherein you dwell unveiledly, unveiledly an abode surrounded by the coincidence of contradictories and this coincidence is the wall of paradise wherein you dwell. The gate of this wall is guarded by a most lofty rational spirit. Unless this spirit is vanquished the entrance will not be accessible. Therefore, on the other side of the coincidence of contradictories, you can be seen, but not at all on this side. If then, O oh Lord, in your sight impossibility is necessity, then there is nothing which your sight does not see. So what does he mean that God can be seen on the other side of this wall, do you think? How can we see God? Sorry? The unknown? Jeff? Empathise with the knowledge. What type of sight do you think he's talking about? Same sight as God has. Hmm. Hmm. We see God in everything around us, in nature and music and so forth. And, and um, Heidi said, God, we see God the way God sees us. Hmm. 
So we don't see God behind this little wall, a man with a grey beard. <laughs> um, yeah, Kuza says, he says, the invisible truth of your face I see not with the bodily eyes, which look at this icon of you, but with mental and intellectual eyes. So this type of vision he's talking about is beyond reason and beyond all means of conceptualising. And in fact, in the first paragraph leading into this piece, he says that he is going to explain to us the wonders which are revealed beyond all sensible, rational and intellectual sight. And I talked about the distinction between those three levels, you know, from the senses to the, ration, uh, senses to the rational and intellectual uh, this morning. He says, I will attempt to lead you by way of experiencing and through a very simple and very common means into most sacred darkness. Now, what does he mean by uh, sacred darkness? He used the word obscuring mist in that quote we just read as well. Well, think about this coincidence of opposites that we've just seen with the icon. When two things seem at the same time, two things, two opposite things seem to both be true at the same time, it's a little confusing, isn't it? And in fact, the more, you know, anyone that's ever thought long and, and deeply about the nature of God or any really profound question, doesn't it always, you always become a little bit, oh, that just, I can't make sense of it, you know, you get to a point where you're trying to figure it out or get a mental image of it and it is like getting into an obscuring mist and in fact most people who are used to the scientific methods of today would just give up and forget about it, I'm going to become an atheist. <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, this method of the coincidence of opposites, Kuza was directly challenging the prevailing theory of Aristotle which was the, the law of non-contradiction which stated that two things that are opposite cannot both be true at the same time. And that was the prevailing, that was, um, Aristotle called it the surest of all principles. Two opposites cannot both be true at the same time. So Kuza was really um, taking on the sacred cows here. Um, and when he talked about the, the sacred darkness or the obscuring mist, he also talks in the same sense about learned ignorance, that we try to attain a notion or a vision of God and we realise that we can't. Um, he says, I know I cannot conceptualise you and the wall, he says, is the limit of my ability to conceptualise. The only way to scale that wall is to vanquish lofty reason, to get out of that mode of thinking. Now, um, God's vision itself, let's have a very quick look at what he talks about with God's vision itself. He says that God, how does God see? Well, he has absolute sight. In fact, God sees all sight. He sees your ability to see what you see. I mean, this is really the idea of all seeing. Uh, he says, teach me how it is that your gaze sees all sight that sees every object that can be seen and every act of seeing as well as all power to see, all power to be seen and every actual seeing that arises from both. So not just what's seen but the, what's potentially able to be seen. God sees from infinity. God has no limits. Think about infinity for a while. What's infinity? Well, We'll talk about it more in the, in the um, Q&A, but Kuz says that in infinity, end has no ending. There's one good example for you. He says, infinity is an object so intelligible that it can never be fully understood. So intelligible that it can never be fully understood. In other words, it is infinitely intelligible. You can make it intelligible, but then there's more of it and more of it. God exists in eternity. He sees from eternity. God created, as Kuza said, everything at once. He conceives once because he doesn't exist in time. Everything he conceives to be is instantly. 
in one moment. And then it unfolds over the course of time. Universals and particulars coincide in God. For example, you know, think about a universal like the idea of justice, capital J. God sees that universal principle, but he also sees every single individual instance of justice, lowercase j. So this is a phenomenal image uh, that Kuza maps out of what God is capable of doing. God unfolds creation through the course of time at the same time that he enfolds or brings into himself creation. So he's doing both of these things, unfolding and enfolding, simultaneously, both at once. Now, for God, uh, sorry, for man, I should say, to try to adopt God's vision, what is required, what is involved in our adopting God's vision? Just, and we've had only a very little glance at it. But this is what Kuza wants you to think about. Um, now, this morning we spoke about this concept of the Holy Spirit or of the Word as the bridge between God and man. And this is something that Kuza looks at. In fact, most of the quotes I used in that class were from this paper. Um, so we've got this eternal realm of the garden behind the wall and God's you know, given us a capability, this word that speaks within us and does not cease to speak within us as a bridge to be able to, for us, as he said, we don't need to look further than within ourselves to be able to get onto that bridge. Um, and he talks about free will in this regard because this is not just something that pops into you, you know, and suddenly the word's speaking to you and you're off on the bridge, you know, <laughs> making your discoveries and being creative. Um, he says it's up to you. You know, each individual has the free will to listen to that voice or not to listen to that voice. Um, and he's got a beautiful way of putting it. He says, how will I have you, O Lord? How will I entreat you? For what is more absurd than to ask that you, who are all in all, give yourself to me? How will you give yourself to me unless you likewise give to me the sky and the earth and everything in them? Because they're all in God. Indeed, how will you give yourself to me unless you also give me to myself? And while I am quietly reflecting in this manner, you, O Lord, answer me in my heart with the words, be your own and I will be yours. And he goes on to say, you know, therefore this matter is up to me. You do not coerce me. It is up to me. You await my choosing. And he, he talks about this icon. This is why he uses this image of Rembrandt. Oh, well, he doesn't use Rembrandt. He has an image of God that was painted at the time. Um, but, of course, the icon never turns away from you. It's always looking at you. So even if you turn away from God for any length of time, you can always come back to it because he's always looking at you. And the other significant thing is that he always appears to only be looking at you. So, and this is again the universal and the particular coinciding because the icon sees all of you and we saw with the one person moving, the one person staying still. But yet you think about... Um, this question of man being in the image of God, you, you are, it's like you are the most important person in the universe because it appears that that icon is only looking at you. And that's really crucial because you think about the building of nation states. Unless you have that level of importance attached to each and every individual, equal in the eyes of God, then you're not going to have the flourishing of a beautiful culture that will sustain a nation state beyond its initial conception. Um, so, and I just want to end with um, the fact that Kuza says that man acts like God when he creates. Well, I'm saying that, but that's basically what he says. <laughs> he communes with the infinite realm of universal principles and brings them into actuality. Man breathes physical life into a mere, what was a mere concept or an idea. Think about the bridge that Nolene showed. 30 years it took for Bradfield to get a government to do it. It took 18 years for Christopher Columbus to convince a government, a kingdom, to give him the boats to sail to America. 
and he gave up a dozen times. This is the importance of the nation state. Without nation states, you don't get these kind of revolutionary projects. But it's based upon the idea of one individual being creative. That's where it starts. Um, Helga said, the state of mind, this is from the sweetness of truth, the state of mind which thus surpasses mere understanding and reason is precisely vision or the vision of God. De visione Dei. In a sense, therefore, we are seeing through God's eyes. As Cusa put it, but that which the eye sees, it can neither speak of nor understand, for it is the eye's secret love and hidden treasure. Now, if you can't speak of it or even understand it, it therefore comes down. What you've seen therefore comes down in how you express it to how you live your life, how you act and your creative output. Because though you may not be able to express or signify what you have seen, it yet drops within your heart the sweetness that was born of it, to borrow words from the Italian poet Dante. So that's a very quick, um, a few, a little bit of a teaser just to get the thoughts running. And now we'll uh, discuss it.